lamentations in poetry which date from that period. And the Arab poets of the time talk about the feelings of anguish and terror which the Crusaders, or the Franks as they're called in the Arab sources, caused the local people, the old women, the young girls, those who are cloistered away in their houses are trembling with fear. The whole imagery is, th is that of uh, the rape of their land and the um, terrible impurities caused by these barbarian infidels coming into their sacred space. We have mingled blood with flowing tears and there is no room left in us for pity. To shed tears is man's worst weapon when the swords stir up the embers of war. When blood has been spilt, when sweet girls must hide their lovely faces in their hands for shame. The first crusade was over. Of the 100,000 men who began the campaign, most would eventually return to Europe, having had only a glimpse of Muslim life. The job of occupying Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside fell to the 20,000 who remained, indefinitely. To secure their occupation, the intruders did here what they had done in Europe. They built castles. The Crusaders built the finest castles that the Near East has ever seen. And the proof of that is that they're still there. When everything else may have faded away, the Crusader castles remain a living testimony to their presence. And Crac des Chevaliers in Syria is the Crusader castle over them all. It's very, very big, it's strong, it's impenetrable. It's a living example of the way that a number of the Crusader castles couldn't be taken by siege. You can see for miles and miles from it and see the other castles that would have been, you know, in visual distance for communication by fire and smoke signals. It's got, you know, all the accoutrements of a, of a good medieval castle with battlements and turrets and places for pouring boiling oil and other liquids down onto the enemy. But inside that castle, what was life really like? It wasn't merriment and, and festivity. It was constant fear. You had to be on the lookout in case someone was trying to mine the castle or to climb over the walls with scaling ladders. The people outside, the population, the local peasantry, they were not uh, friendly, so you had to watch their movements all the time. It, it was a, a terrifying place. The Crusaders made treaties and broke them. They harassed the traders who passed by their castles. As they raided caravans, the Crusaders learned of a luxurious lifestyle unheard of in Europe. Well, materially, the Crusaders were just blown away by what they found in the Middle East, and they took a lot of it back with them. Uh, inlaid metalwork, uh, textiles, silks, things like that. They had just never seen in such quantities before. The good life. These things they brought back to Europe, some as souvenirs, and in fact there was a whole uh, industry that developed in the Middle East of providing souvenirs for the Crusaders to take back. It is perhaps a Western bias to imagine the Crusaders were a decisive force in world events, devastating to the Islamic culture and trade. The truth is, while the Knights of the Crusades were bunkering down in their castles, Islam was spreading its influence and flourishing. Muhammad's message rang out as clear and strong as it ever had. Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! 
Mosques were now on every horizon. They welcomed traders. They housed schools and hospitals. Through Islamic architecture, literature and music, a vibrant culture was emerging in celebration of a singular faith. Faith had launched an empire. Culture was now enlivening it. But ultimately, what united it was trade. For the Muslims, trade, like science, brought innovation. Business was expedited by a revolutionary concept called the SAC, a check that could be written in Spain and cashed in India. Writing a check assumes that someone's going to honor it and cash it at the other end, and that if you give the money or you have the money in one place, that someone will say, I have access to that somewhere else. So this implies that you have some kind of central bank or central loan organization who's going to be good for the money. Um, so it frees up your ability to travel. Um, it frees up commerce because, again, the money doesn't have to be moved from Samarkand back to, to Cordova in order to go back the other way the next year so that you can base it all on trust and faith. Uh, and Muslims became some of the greatest merchants of Middle Ages. And the greatest craftsmen as well. From the Persians, Muslim blacksmiths learned how to fold steel to give it strength and flexibility. The swords made in Toledo and Damascus had no equal in the world. But the economic backbone of Islam's expanding wealth was textiles. The demand for the products of Muslim looms was enormous, for Kashmir, cotton and silk. Textiles were simply the gas and steel industry of medieval times. Because you have to think of textiles not only as growing the plants, but making all the dyes. And it was the dyes that were particularly expensive and uh, imported the farthest. And then you need all the fixtures and mordants and uh, equipment for looms. And then you need to transport these textiles. So collectively, the industry of making and transporting textiles was the mainstay of the economy. While Europeans settled for coarse woolen and linen garments, Muslims wore brocaded fabrics of organdy, damask and taffeta, words that came into the English language from Arabic and Persian. The fabrics that were produced in the Islamic world were among the finest ever produced. And they were made of not only plain linen or cotton, but also very, very fancy silks, um, cloth of gold where silk thread is wrapped with gold um, and um, with very, very complicated patterns. These complex patterns were coveted by wealthy Europeans and the church as well. When the Christians needed a cloth worthy of wrapping the bones of their saints, the choice was obvious. They looked to a Muslim loom. But sometimes the fabrics were trimmed with decorative Arabic text from the Holy Quran. And so the words of the Prophet sometimes appeared in shocking proximity to Christendom's holiest icons. It is not unusual to find in uh, Italian Renaissance paintings, for example, to find uh, paintings of the Virgin wearing a robe of very fancy patterned cloth and precious silks embroidered with gold um, or woven with gold designs. Sometimes uh, they would say things with an Arabic inscription on it. 